Father, we thank you so much for your loving kindness and tender mercies. You, Father, you've drawn us to the best gift that you could supply and that you could give to us. The gift of your only begotten Son. Oh, God. The gift to be able to come to the cross and there put away sin and death and rebellion and darkness. The gift, oh God, to be able to be made in your image and your likeness, renewed all over again in righteousness and true holiness. To be buried together with you, Lord Jesus. Ah, to be so hidden away that the life, former life has so ceased and so no longer exists that it's buried all together. That we may be raised up together with you, Lord, and be seated with you, walking out this wonderful life in you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, Father's just waiting. He's waiting for us to be broken before Him. Somebody says, what is broken? Broken says, I can't go on without you, Lord. I cannot continue to exist out of the definition of my own value and my own meaning, my own concept of life in this world. It just, it's a brokenness that says, God, I've got to be used by you. Lord, I want to understand what it means to live this heavenly life. I want to understand what it means to flow in the Holy Ghost. You become broken. You become totally detached from all value and all meaning that is given in this world system that humanity holds on to. I minister to you some this morning on Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. But to get to the heart of it, just, you know, here's what I see. I, here's what I see. Here's what I see. Just keep doing what you're doing. And the fire and the presence and the glory of the living God will break forth to your life. I promise you. If, here's the hardest thing. As soon as people begin to feel, they begin to experience a little bit of that reward of His presence. Sometimes they, they stop there. They just stop there. And then if not careful, you know, distractions will come along even in ministry where people want to place more demand on you and where there are other options just become more apparent. Sometimes it's just, it can be business plans, it can be ministry plans, but if you stay in the place where you find that and you don't leave, you'll, be bro you'll discover brokenness. And there, in that place of brokenness, the glory of God. Very few people come to it. Understand me. Understand me clearly. Very few people do this. That's why there's very, that's why the minority, that's why the few do the work of the many. Very few people do this. We want to have, we want to have our life in his life too. But what God the Holy Ghost does is he begins to work on our life to where that we can't, we got to have him. And here we are in this state. We're just, Lord, I've got to have you. I've got to be used by you, Lord. I've got to see, sense and know that glory that you described that I may have in your word. And, and that outpouring of, of, of a, a such neediness where nothing else even matters. Money doesn't matter. House doesn't matter. Clothes doesn't matter. Things don't matter. What, you know, value men put on you, reputation men put on you, what you can succeed in doing, house don't matter. Nothing matters. It doesn't matter. You just got to have him. You got to know him. That's God the Holy Ghost at work. That voice cries out in men everywhere and to men everywhere. Some people ignore it and they just put it aside. They're moved by it on Sunday mornings or Sunday night or a meeting night. But then they, and, and they come to the altar and that's what we call the altar call consciousness or the altar call awareness. And then they go back to their everyday life and immediately they're ensnared, they're engulfed, they're immersed, they're surrounded, they're over their head, they're just swimming as it were to the surface trying to keep their head above water because they have all the bills, they have all the issues, they have all the various things that they've already established in their life and it's like a trap that they can't get out of. It's like a track, it's like a groove, it's like a monorail. They can't get out of it. But brokenness before God, this is Father. I'm done with me. I don't want me. I want the heavenly life. I want the life that you define. I've got to have it. And it's deeper and deeper and deeper still. And you stay there. You stay there. I, I, just, hear, I just hear and I sense 
Listen, I, you must understand. I hear and I sense something that I haven't felt and sensed since I was a little guy. When I was a little guy, several great moves of the Spirit took place. One of them we call the Jesus Revival or the Jesus Movement. The other one we call the Faith Movement. Kind of a faith healing movement and a faith word movement. And out of that, literally, the, the, the nations of the earth were shaken. I mean, it's like I was talking, ministering to a, a girl who was driving us home last night through Lyft. It's a great way to minister. Did you know that? It costs you a few dollars to get a ride. You don't have to bother your family and friends, and you get to minister to somebody. It's a captive audience. They can't tell you to be quiet. There was a time where you were going to start talking to someone, start ministering to them, in the, and there was just a flow of heaven, as it were. And I believe that the church, by and large, we the ones who decide whether or not that flow of heaven is going to be there. And I'm talking about when you started ministering, we're not talking about repeat after me. We're talking sobbing, brokenness, quaking. Look, it's beautiful to have lived revival in the sense to where that there is an awakening where people as it were, aren't having continual demonic interference running between them and the message of salvation. But it's happening. It's coming. I won't compromise. There's been, I've had so many different people said, Mark, if you'll just make these alterations and come over here and be a part of us and do these things, you're going to have a big church. I'm like, well, I'm really not interested in a big church. I'm interested in a big move of God. Yes. And then somebody will say, well, Mark, you know, you, if you just come over here and do these few things and make these few modifications, I'm telling you, God would be able to use you more. Well, I just want more of Him. I don't want modifications. And I pray today, I pray that every one of you today, you'll take your life, the ideas and your concepts, and you'll say, wait a minute, as long as I continue to live in my life, my ideas, my concepts, I can't walk in the mind of Christ. I can't walk in the mind of the Spirit. I'll never have what the Word of God ha says I can have. And people will come along and say, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a substitute. But they won't, they won't present it as a substitute. They'll, they'll present it as a real deal, but you'll never have the real deal. You'll never have it. And so much of the church has erred in that way. And I pray today, I pray that you get so fired up by the presence and the power of God that you just find yourself living in a place of brokenness. You find yourself living in a place of neediness where you're so desperate for the outpouring of God the Holy Ghost on your life and through your life. And that, and that you'll know that Father has a place that He's called you to be. It's not just any place. It's a place He's called you to be. He's, he's, there's things He's called you to do. And He looks in your heart and He looks in your response and He says, how desperate do you want it? How needy are you for it? Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. And if, you're, if your response will be continually desperate, continually needy, if you just begin to cry out to Him, oh God, use me. Oh God, use me. Oh God, I want to be everything that's, I want to be everything that you purposed me to be. It don't matter what it cost. You already paid the cost, so it doesn't matter what it cost me. Amen. Everybody, you can just be seated. It's so good to be with you this morning. And, you know, and, I, and listen, you know, I don't know where everybody is this morning. I think a lot of people went on vacation. I hope that that's what they were doing. Somebody said, well, when folks don't know that you're here, the attendance of the ministry goes way down. I pray that that isn't the case. I, and I'm very thankful and blessed for everybody who's faithful in this ministry. You just have to understand my continual crying out to God has gotten some results in my life. And we can, and, um, it's on, a, on a weekly basis, we have people scheduling us, asking us to come. And about six months ago, you know, a little over six months ago, the Lord told me that he was going to start sending me to the United States of America, to the churches in the United States of America. And then all of a sudden it started happening. I said, Lord, whatever door you open up, I will walk through. There was a time in my life where they would have many different doors open up, different people would ask me to come and minister to in their churches and whatnot, and, their, and even in their nations, and I would say, no, I can't do it. The Lord has me in San Diego, and people would look at me and go, my goodness, you're actually containing the gifting that God has placed in you. You're limiting it and confining it by being 
you know, where you're at. And the Spirit of the Lord would just constantly encourage me, no, you're not. You're not containing me and you're not defining me. You're, you're uh, yeah, limiting me. You're, you're doing what I've told you to do. And so we just faithfully serve the Lord. But finally, you know, here, and, and we're going to continue to do so. I mean, we see not only the church in San Diego going on and growing and becoming a, what God declared we would be. And so many people, I mean, everybody I've ever seen. Now you, I tell you, no matter what situation is in. When I first came to San Diego many years ago, um, there was a number of men of God, prophets and, and men of God who had been used in, in some wonderful ways, to, declared things that God would do through um, my life. And when I came to San Diego, and that was back in 1979, and, you know, we're still waiting for that, so many of those things to happen because they haven't happened. Even though we had great things have happened in the ministry, all that, you know, ha the Lord said is going to take place hasn't taken place yet. I mean, I, it was... It didn't matter where I was at. It didn't matter what kind of move of God. When I, uh, when I first met Rodney, Rodney said, you start on the West Coast, I'll start on the East Coast. We'll meet in the middle. In the middle. I mean, I've always had all of those things, those prophetic words, those declarations of the Lord. And it seemed like they were slow in coming. We've been, you know, had times in like being in Seal Beach with, you know, 6,000 people jammed into the building. And, you know, and, and from everybody from Newport Beach to Huntington, all those areas. And then see you come down and be, you know, 15, 20 people in the meeting in San Diego. See, but yeah, the bottom line of it is none of that matters. I'm detached. I'm detached. I'm just doing, I'm living out the will of God. Somebody says, what if I start serving God and it costs me everything? That's good. Just be detached. Because Father's looking for some people who will be so detached that he'll say, okay, now that I've given you everything that I promised you and everything that I said, my relationship and my covenant was based upon with you, that you would ultimately have you know, an inheritance to where the, your seed would fill the earth as the stars of the heaven and the sands of the seas. Now that you have it, I want you to go and sacrifice an altar on an altar that I will show you. I want you to sacrifice some there. And immediately Abraham rose up early in the morning and took off because he was completely detached. He was going after something. He was a stranger and a sojourner seeking a kingdom whose builder and maker is God. And I want you to understand, dear people, many things will come along in our life be, and especially as the anointing begins to increase, listen to me, as the brokenness begins to become that much more enriched within our life, the neediness that much more enriched in our life, where we're saying, oh God, use me, oh God, use me. It's free, but it's not cheap. Listen, God gave to us this wonderful gift and, and, and poured it upon whosoever will, but it's still as sacred and holy as it's ever been. And so Father's waiting to see within our lives the kind of hunger and the kind of desperation and kind of neediness to which this sacred thing, this, this, this riches of heaven that he's poured out abundantly upon us can be received. Listen to me. I want you to hear what I'm telling you. I want you to grab a hold of what I'm telling you. People get, it's easily get, it's easy to get distracted. Wrong decisions, wrong decisions will create deception. Listen to me. Wrong decisions will create deception. The word of God has already decided for us. Wrong decisions will create deceptions. Father's shown us where to place every step. And the beautiful thing of it is the Holy Spirit has come to work within our lives, a certainty within our emotions, within our appetites, within our feelings, those things that God has purposed for us to have. And then, you know, in, that, in the midst of that, Father is at work drawing us as gifts unto His only begotten Son. All we got to do is be all in. And the reality of it is, is what's keeping us from being all in is what society has demanded upon us and, and what, what our peers and significant people in our life has demanded of us to do and to be if we're, if we're going to be, as it were, acceptable and responsible. And so then we've got the pile of everything that God said we're not supposed to have and that's the that's the demarcation line what you're going to do open your bibles to matthew chapter 6 and verse 24 i'm just so excited this past week what we were doing is we were uh hallelujah we did the uh, foundation well we did the the pad of the of our of the church in in uh oregon quartz Mont, what we're calling quartz mountain full gospel I remember I took a friend of mine who, who uh, I mean, he's, he's a man of faith. You know, he's a man of faith. God had used him in so many different ways. I mean, he's, he's uh, T.L. Osborne called him the Apostle Paul of the 21st century. And I was showing him all that we were going to do. And, and he's like, Mark, he's like, 
goodness. He said, that's a lot of work. I mean, how, how are you going to do this? What's your budget look like? I said, well, I don't even have a budget. Watch what happens. And now, basically, most of the stuff that he was looking at four years ago that was nothing but bare land is already up, and it's moving, and praise God for it. Because the reality of it is, is uh, money's not the currency of heaven. Faith is. Yeah. And somebody says, I mean, the greatest compliment that can, anyone can give me is to say, man, you are totally detached when it comes to making decisions based upon your financial capabilities. You're totally detached from the financial responsibility that you're constantly, your decisions are getting you in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I want to show you why I would say thank you very much to that. Because so many people stand at the crossroads of decision. And they're at the crossroads of decision. They are faced with, on one hand, the great dreams and visions that God has put in their heart. You know how God put them in your heart? He began to inspire them in you by the reading of his word, by the testimonies of those who responded to his word and began to move forward in faith. And all of a sudden, you now begin to have birth within your heart and it, a, a visions and dreams, you begin to get excited about it. And at the crossroads of decision, you're looking at visions and dreams over here in God, the call of God. And over here, you're looking at what money says you can and cannot do. And over and again, we watch it as people go and they are not detached from those things that they have made extremely valuable in their life that they've allowed to govern them and they'll make a decision to follow what the money says that they can and cannot do. And it's not just about money. It's everything that you hold dear. And so I'm gonna, I want to grab a hold of you here this morning with a couple of verses of Scripture. You know, and, and, you know, Jesus, here's what Jesus said about it in Matthew chapter 10. He said, unless you hate father and mother and brother and sister, huh, and, and all the things, I mean, in, in comparison to, in comparison to your love and commitment and consecration to the life that I made available to you, he gives a word, a very strong word, because with God it's hate or love. It's a Hebrewism that least to least prefer, to hate something as you least prefer it. You're not going to make your decisions based upon it. And he says, and you're on your own life also, and take up your cross and follow of me. Follow me. You're not worthy of me. If you don't hate mother and father and brother and sister, you're not worthy of me. It goes to the list. This is what Jesus has to say about it. And people are constantly making decisions based upon, well, how is it going to impact my children? And now I'm not going to trust God. I'm not going to believe that he has my most, my well-being and my most favored position in view of his request and call him on, upon my life. I'm going to rather try to manage the program and be protective of my children and make decisions based upon what I think. And therefore, I'm going to miss out on all the blessings of the Lord. I'm not willing to respond to his voice and say, now take your son that you love and come and bring him as a whole burnt offering and sacrifice him on an altar that I will show you. There's no way I'm going to get up and do that. And there's no way I'm going to inherit the promises of God because there's no way I'm going to get up and obey God and give to him what he gave to me that I can easily forget that he gave it to me because after all, I can look at a biological function and say, well, there were, you know, this just worked out and uh, the way it did and the, and the Red Sea just so happened you know, to, to part and the, you know, the Jordans just so happened to stack up as a pillar from the earth to heaven and it just so happened to rain down this coriander seed, what we called man. And it just so happened. And we can explain away the provision of God's miracle and His love and His grace and His goodness to us so easily. People say, how could people walk around with a fire of God by night and a pillar of cloud by day and still be so aloof from His presence? Because you can explain it away. You can justify it to be something other than it is. And you can normalize God and confine Him to what you want and your wishes and what you think. Things have to have to be and the way you believe it's got to work out God wants you to say detached yeah that's about right two people and they breathed it out very low say detached, detached. say it again detached. because if, unfortunately too many people are attached you are attached to other things not God oh I love Jesus well you're only responsible you're only responsible the only real legitimate response to God's love for you is obedience to Him. And don't try to normalize it. Don't try to say it's something other than what He said. It's plainly exactly what He said. And if you say that He's a, a, an, a, a man who's harsh, like a man who's harsh, and like a man who is overbearing, who reaps where he has not sown, uh, who gathers where he has not planted, 
then you're going to take what he gave to you and you're going to hide it away in the earth and he's going to say, look at this unfaithful servant. Take from him that which he has and give it to those who have something who took what I gave to them and used it and, value, and made it the meaning and the value of their entire existence. This is, where, this is where we are at today. So I want you to hear what Jesus says. I don't want you to redefine it, okay? I want you to let God define it for you. I want you to understand that there, he has already decided that you and I can walk around in his fullness. He's already decided that you and I are supposed to be ministers and witnesses of the kingdom. That we're supposed to sh show forth his glory by signs and wonders and miracles. That we're supposed to live out a heavenly life, not an earthly one that is confined on the value system of what you make at your job, what clothes you wear, the houses that you plan, the vacation that you plan, how many children you're going to have. If you're going to have children, it's for the one purpose and one purpose only, to raise up prophets. And, and, and prophetess, ministers of the gospel, and by and large, people don't do that. Because you can only reproduce after your own kind. So you're going to have to have a passionately sold out vision for the kingdom of God to even be able to do that. Because God hasn't just called you to raise up any seed. He's called you to raise up a godly seed. <laughs> He's called you to raise up people who function and operate in the realms of that which he so graciously poured out upon us when he gave to us this wonderful gift of salvation and gave to us the gift of the Holy Ghost so that you and I could be taught of God and mentored by him every day to walk in his character, his nature, his ways, his abundance of life, his love, his joy, his peace, his divine realms of the heavenly, I mean a glorious realm that all the world, though they could not know it nor understand it, they would look upon it like the stars and the galaxies that they can see with the, with the telescopes and even with the naked eye and say, wow, it is marvelous, it's wondrous, we don't understand it. But it sure is spectacular. You and I are supposed to be the light of the world. And there are many people who respond to this light. There are many people who love darkness rather than light. You know, many, there's folks who said, you know, that Marxism and Islam and the New Age aren't the big threats to God's people. It's materialism and luxury and love of ease. That's all found in the privilege now because this is a unique phenomenon. Only over the past few centuries has there been governments that have been willing to be sympathetic to Christianity. It's not always that way. I can take you to nations right now, places right now where I've just come from. Whether it was Cuba or Kashmir or uh, other places in India. That if you're a Christian, you're not going to get the job. If you're a Christian, most people, in, the statistics are off in India concerning how many Christians are in India. Right now, the statistics say there's approximately 6% or, uh, Christian right around in there. They're not, it's, it's not accurate because in India, as well as in Kashmir, if you, you know, you basically born on your, you know, as it were, in your birth certificate on your driver's license, a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian. Now, if you're a Hindu and you go ahead and give your life to Jesus, it would actually be a disservice to you to go ahead and file a report saying you're a Christian now because you're a persecuted minority. You're not going to get the job. You're not, going to get, you're not going to have the favor of the government as you were if you were a Hindu. And it goes on and on. In a communist country, it's the same way in a communist country. You put it on there, you're a Christian, you're a persecuted minority. We've got a Western civilization by and large that over the past... 400 years has been sympathetic to Christianity. And so in, that, in view of that, those who know the Lord have been able to prosper. And the blessing of that in turn to the government is you've had things that are unique like the United States of America. But we know our president told us a couple of years ago, I think it was 2010, that we're no longer a Christian nation. You know, that was his news flash to himself and to those who want to listen to him because uh, as far as he wasn't talking to me because this is a Christian nation. And as long as, as long as we hear it's a Christian nation and the moment in time that we quit being Christian nation, we're going to become impoverished like other nations like India, Nepal, the rest of the world. Because they got, I can take you to so many places. They have as many natural resources and even more natural resources that we have, but they don't serve our God. And, this, and, and because there's so much confusion in Christianity today, people don't even know the name of our God. Some people actually think that Allah is the name of our God. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ, there's no Allah in it. Okay? And there's no any other kind of uh, Allah in it. Okay? It's Jesus Christ. Okay? 
There's no Ada name in it. There's no Allah name in it. Okay, are you with me? It's just Jesus. It's Jesus. Somebody said to me the other day, oh, we serve the same God. A Muslim said, we serve the same God. I said, wow, I didn't know you served Jesus. And then they're looking at me all shocked because they heard some of our Christian leaders tell us, even as far as Kashmir, some of the Christian leaders tell the people in the United States of America, they're in the church as well as the world, that uh, Muslims and Christians serve the same God. <laughs> what, a, what a wild idea. What a, what, a, what a glorious thing that would be. But what a wild idea. Reality of it is, is many people in the church have turned his glory into something that is profane. They turn his glory into something that is shameful. They turn his glory into things that have absolutely nothing to do with what he described for us to do and to be. He's described for you and I to be Jesus, to live the life of Jesus, to live the life of signs and wonders and miracles and display of the power of God, the fullness of everything that belongs to his realm of divine power and glory. There's something holding us back, though. And, Jesus, and, and the beautiful thing about the word is the word of God shows us what holds us back. The word of God gives us insight. You know, Jesus really sets this up. I'm going to start in verse 21 of Matthew chapter 6. He says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where's your treasure? Where's, where's your desperate need? Where's all that you want and all that you desire? Once again, there are very few people who come to this. People play religious games. They accommodate what their parents and what their teachers and what their peers said is absolutely essential, important. It's more money. It's more clothing. It's more fame. It's more fortune. It's more of your stuff. It's your materialism. And we say, oh, well, God has purpose to give us material things. No, he's not. He said, you know, John said, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, but in proportion to your spiritual soulish prosperity. Praise God. As your soulish, in soulish prosperity. Hallelujah. That's proper uses of soulish now. Hallelujah. <laughs> As your soul prospers. Go read it for yourself. Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> I'm not interested in wealth that I would make of my own hands. I'm interested in the wealth that Father would give me because all I am about is the kingdom of God. I'm not about me. I'm not about doing it for, using it for my own gratification, for my own desires. I'm about the purposes of the kingdom of God. Well, that's decided long before you get any wealth. Somebody said, I stepped out to obey God and to follow him and take out my cross and I lived from pillar to post and I got so tired of living from pillar to post and having to walk in by faith. Well, the righteous live by faith. Yes. And it's a, the, the, the walk of the Spirit is a faith walk. A faith walk is where you absolutely depend upon God and trust Him solely for everything and desire no other source of provision. And cursed is the man who trusts in the arm of flesh, his own human provision, his own human ability to supply. Listen to me. I'm talking to you from heaven. I'm talking about why there's few doing the work of the many instead of the many doing the work of the few. I'm telling you how you can get into a place of neediness before God where all you want is what he has for you. You quit limiting yourself. You quit limiting God. You quit confining what God will do through your life. And you begin to respond to his word that describes who, and, who you and I ought to be. And you want that, his will, more than anything else. That you come alongside Jesus and you say, it is written in me. The volume of the book is all about me to do your will, O oh God. Because I don't find myself outside of Christ Jesus because there is no existence outside of Christ Jesus. I know religion has tried to make another Jesus prominent, but that Jesus that religion has created is no God at all. Jesus Christ of the Word, Jesus Christ, the miracle, King of kings and Lord of lords who brings forth the miraculous new birth who's called us to a completely unique and different kind of life that we're born into is the only God. He's the only God and he's calling out to you and me. The laborers are few. Believe me. People are distracted with the lust of the flesh. It's a stronghold of the demonic power and they continually go back to it continually. Jesus, the Lord says those who practice sin do not know God. 
Practicing sin means you continue on in it. You've never found the place of it broken off of you. The chain has never been broken. The attachment, the fixation with the lust of the flesh has never been broken. The lust of the eye. Those things that you can look upon in a natural world and you can desire and it becomes that which you must have. And now you place it above your desire for Father because it is opposed to His will. And now you're living completely attached to the demonic influence which is wrought or brought to pass through everything that is in this social structure of, of that which Satan himself dominates. The human mind and thinking and soul. People... You know, the pride of life, really, when you look at that particular word in 1 John chapter 2, I believe it's verse 17, you know, where the Lord's saying, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, okay? And the world and the lust thereof will pass away. But they who do the will of God, who abide in Him and do His will, they, they will exist throughout the ages. And we have, we have this wonderful contrast set up before us. And the wonderful contrast is being able to abide in Christ Jesus, do the will of the Father, or to be, cons to be consumed with all that you can have that fulfills and gratifies some earthly, sensual, temporal need. He says the contrast. And there, with the pride of life, it says literally, this is a unique word, and it's not really the word that's used for pride. It's boastings in, boastings in substance. The boasting in substance. Your boast is in what you have, your bank account, the things that everybody's boasting in. And everybody's going for so that they can have more, so that they can boast in it. That they feel bad about themselves if they don't have it. I don't have enough money to pay the bills, so what? Tell the bills to talk to Father. Are you listening to me? Tell the bills to have a dialogue with pops because you're totally detached. Are you listening to me? If you don't learn that, you're never going to learn how to stand at the crossroads of decisions where God is beckoning you and he's calling you and he's inspiring you with a still small voice saying, go ahead and dream big. Go ahead and dream big for this nation. Go ahead and dream big for this city. Go ahead and dream big for this town. Go ahead and dream big for this person or for these people or for your family or for your friends or for people that you do not know. All our life is about is delivering people from a... a from an agony of, of eternal torment, number one, and bringing them into the joys of this wonderful heavenly life which God paid such a high price for us to have. So listen, I'm telling you, if you're willing to just walk by people who are being destroyed, houses burning down with people, the screams of people in it to be delivered, then you know what? You are detached. Uh, to, you're detached against the wrong things. We're supposed to be attached to his divine compassion and love for the lost and dying world. But as long as we're attached to the world, the spirit of the world is going to overwhelm our emotions, our desires, those things that we hold dear. You're listening to me. And we'll be detached from all the affections and the passions and the compassions of God Almighty. But it just, because really, all this is going to start just in a basic love relationship. Where you're filled up with, with, with his love. He, you come to know his love for you. You're filled up in response of, of love for him. And you see the beautiful things that he's called us to be and to do. And you, and you begin to desire them. And you begin to want them more than anything else. You begin to experience his presence and his life to you. And now everything else that has vied for your attention and vied for your servitude is easily rejected. But... Somehow, many of God's people have lost that moment. They've lost that. If they ever had that moment, they lost it. They lost that first love. They lost that passion and that affection for him to where you're just so, just so in love with him and what he's done for you and the reality. See, it's a revelation that comes by the Holy Ghost to cause us to recognize that we live somewhere forever, heaven or hell. It's a revelation from heaven that causes us to realize that, wait a minute, the judgments of God are real. That in reality, everything that God wants is what you deep down inside want and what you feel really with respect to your own self-interest. In other words, you don't want anybody stealing from you. Huh? Now, however, however, 
if suddenly some selfish interest kicks in, you might actually be content, con willing and contented to steal from someone else to satisfy some selfish gratification. Nobody wants their spouse to commit adultery and go with somebody else over them. No one. But, and, and, but, 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 if some self-gratification is able to do, dominate you, you will do that which you will violate someone else in such a way that you would never want someone to violate you. So God has brought us into a place of coming to understand what it really means to live the right kind of life. And it goes beyond the description that I just gave to you. It's much, much higher than all of that. And that's just the kind of the basic understanding of it. But we've never, many people have never come to an encounter with God to have even that much insight and that much wisdom and that much resolve of their will to live their life and conduct their life after a manner of that which is just basically right. And Father wants to take it much higher than that. He wants to take it all the way to his righteousness. I mean, he can't get more right than that. It goes beyond what we can calculate or think on the, on the basic logic which I just put forth to you. Are you listening to me? Yes. Are you listening to me? Yes. Father's, got, Father's got the abundant life. He's got the good life. He's got the heavenly life. And it's a Holy Ghost revelation that comes to us that can't cause us to recognize, wait a minute, he's got something for us that we desperately want. And then his word sits there, is set before us saying, these are the decisions you've got to make if you're going to have all that I have for you. If you're going to enjoy all the blessings I have for you. I bless you with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm. But you're so sad because you don't have more of your stuff. You're so sad because you don't have enough friends or you don't have enough this or you don't have enough that or somebody did something to violate you or somebody did something to offend you because your value system is misplaced. Misplaced value system. In this place, there's continual ongoing encounters with the president, says the Lord, and the anointing that he has for you and the beauty of living in a place where you're his heirs and his joint heirs, where you're experiencing the overwhelming goodness of his presence. Many people see the light, they come to the light, but they love darkness more than the light because they want to continue on in evil. That's your choice. That's everyone's choice. This revelation that brings the reality of divine judgment that God will hold everybody accountable for violating and profaning that which he created, which is sacred and holy by definition. People are going to have a sudden rude awakening. There are people having a sudden rude awakening right now. They believe that they're right with God, that they're born again, they're on the way to heaven, and they're falling into a devil's hell because they had all of the verbiage, but they had none of the action. They had all of the statements, but they had none of the commitment. They had all of the outward show of things, but they never had the inward change of heart. This wrong decisions result in deception. Deceptions result in apostasy. You don't know how many people that I've looked at and I've warned them. There was a person not too long ago, they were in the hallway up there. I walked by and I warned them. I said, listen, this is what I see on you. This is what's going on in your life. You shut it down right now. And they acted, they acted like I mistreated them. It wasn't long and they're in a lesbian relationship. Apostasy. Listen to me. Reality of it is, is some of us have given ourselves over to love. Some of us have given ourselves over to the Spirit of the Lord. And in that realm, there is judgment. And praise God for His warnings. But ha what happens is people come, become a little rebellious and a little more rebellious and a little more defiant. And they can become a point where they don't have to listen. I just, they agree about some things and disagree about other things. Listen, you can disagree with me all you want. But if I'm declaring the word of God, you better agree. Otherwise, something's going to, bat, something's going to happen that you aren't going to like. Yeah. Huh? Because God gives to us his word to preserve us and protect us. He declares to us these things. He said, I want, I want to give you my protection. I want to give you my life. I want to give you my provision. I want to give you my perfection. I will be faithfully devoted to you. Nothing will be able to separate you from my love. But you've got to be willing to simply do what I've said for you to do. People want to make it up as they go. They want to decide. 
Look, you can make it up as you go and you can decide as long as it is simply not a confrontation with the Word of God. But reality of it is, everything that you decide and everything that you make believe for yourself is, a contra- is literally in conflict. Listen to me. It's in conflict. It's actually an act of striving against God. Do you hear me? And the only reason you can deal with it is because your affections aren't, aren't just totally consumed by Him. If, you're cons- if your affections are totally consumed by Him, you would be so conflicted inside when you're now making decisions and, and making it up as you, go, as you go and deciding for yourself. It would be such a conflict on the inside of you that you would repent quickly. Or you would push through that place where peace has been taken from you and conflict rules and you would make decisions of compromise and in that place you'd be deceived. And we're talking about a huge population in the church right now. Look and see. Because there's everybody saying that, they're, that they know they're sinners. They know Christ Jesus. They're, they're born again and they're just sinners and they're living their own life. And they've got a totally different gospel. And they've got a totally different manner of existence than what is described in the Word of God that is the fruits and the evidence that you've been born again. They that do the will of God shall what? Abide forever. Huh? Everybody who doesn't do the will of God, it's over. The world and the lust thereof will pass away. And if you're in that, you will pass away. But they that do the will of God will abide forever. From Matthew 7, 21 to that verse of scripture I just quoted there, 1 John, what is it? Is it 1 John 2, 17? The Lord's warning over and over again. You can't live your life the way you want to live it because in, do, in so doing, you'll be overrun by demon spirits and won't even know it and will be living out the life that the demonic realm designed for you. And it will be an opposition to what God has brought to pass when you were born again or made available for you to have when he gave to us Christ Jesus as our Savior. When he gave Savior, Deliverer. From a former kind of existence and a former way and manner of living and lifestyle to a whole new manner of life and living. That which Christ Jesus modeled for us. Are you listening to me? I hear people, hey, you know, Christ Jesus is my Lord and Savior and here's my gun to make everybody believe it. You know, the more preachers packing guns today. What are you going to do with that gun? The only person you need it against is someone who's going to kill you in two seconds. That means you've got to be committed to kill them in one second. What are you doing? It's a bunch of lies. It's lies. So many people are living in lies. I watched it. Listen, I knew revivalists, men of God, radical men of God in the 60s. They came out of the 50s revival. In the 60s, they started believing about the Trilateral Association, the Illuminati. They started believing about global takeover and the new world order. And it wasn't long By the early 80s, they were marching around with machine guns and army boots and fatigues up in Montana and still there today and walked away from their anointing. I kid you not. Crazy nonsense. Distractions. I'm not going with it. I'm not going with it. I'm not believing all this nonsense. Satan and the satanic cult. He's the prince of the power there. So what? Jesus Christ has been exalted above all principalities and powers and might and dominion. And we seated together with him. And God has made it purpose, has made a purpose that you and I make the decisions for the nations. If we're in him and live out his life. What do I want? Somebody said that the government will get out of the way. I read this this morning. The government will get out of the way. I can be successful and make money like Donald Trump. Well, that's, you know what? That's stupid. That's counterintuitive at best. First of all, if the government was in the way, how did Donald do it? <laughs> Second of all, that's just stupid by many accounts. It's just, a, it's just a conflict of interest. Because you and I aren't called to those things. We're called to inherit something that's far above that. He who is rich, he who is rich, became poor for our sake, that through his poverty we might be made rich. 
I'm breaking off this yoke, right? I'm busting loose this thing, right? I'm telling you right now, it is something that shuts down anointings and shuts down the moves of God over and over again. People think that God needs wealth to advance his kingdom. Nonsense. He took up people who are nothing but poor, downtrodden, beaten slaves and made them the capital of nations and gave them the wealth and inheritance of all peoples by act of a miracle provision. God's provision always comes by realms of miracle. It always comes as a result of somebody trusting God and willing to walk with Him against the tide of humanity and the tide of the social structure and systems of the world. Somebody said, why must you be intense when you talk like this? Because I'm coming up against the foul spirits of hell that has brought into captivity once again those who are clean and set free and compromise the message. I'm not, I trust not the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. I'll walk with you so long as you walk with him. So long as you obey his word and do that which he has spoken. And you're pursuing something that belongs to his choice. And I'm with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, people. It's time for a breakthrough. It's time for people to take up the anointings that are available to them that God is going to refine you as it were, develop you and mold you to have. And it begins right there at the decision of doing right and doing wrong. Of saying no to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye and the boastings in your substance. And saying, Father, all I want is you. Abraham kept his heart detached. He kept his heart detached. Why? From everything around him, why? Because he was so attached to God. He had an encounter. There is an encounter available for you. And if you've not had that encounter, I'm telling you right now, you're never going to make it. That encounter brings forth a new creation and gives to us the divine ability of sonship to make the right decision. It's that encounter that results in you and I being filled with the Spirit of the Lord and even baptized in His glory and in His power. It is that that produces the contrast where now we can see it's so much better to serve God than to serve the devil. It's so much better to walk in the Spirit and live by faith than to walk after human ability and live by my own hand of provision. Listen to me. Listen to me. It might cost you a lot. It might cost you everything. But the reward is great. I mean, Father may look at you. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that he has done anyone, has done this. And say, I'm going to give you all of the wealth. Because I don't believe he's going to do it that way. He gives the wealth to his church, not an individual. Look at Acts. They came and they sold what they had and they laid it at the apostles' feet. And no one said that anything that they had was their own possession. Go read it again. Go read it again. Hallelujah. Listen to me. We got this whole grandiose system where we are demigods. Somehow we're going to have this wealth and we're going to make all the decisions. I want none of that. I've already watched the many mighty men of God take up army boots and machine guns. No, thank you. No, thank you. I will follow Jesus. Abraham had all the wealth that a man could have. He was exceedingly wealthy. Genesis chapter 13. He was exceedingly wealthy. Exceedingly wealthy in every realm of substance. He could have had anything he wanted. He could have been, he could have built a city with high walls and been the king of it. He said, I'm going to dwell over here in this tent. Uh, lest I forget, I'm going to dwell over here in this tent. I'm going to be a Bedouin. I'm going to be a stranger. I'm going to be a stranger to everything else that everybody else is interested in. I'm going to be a stranger to it. I'm going to be a pilgrim and not attached to anything that all these others are attached to as they go to gain more control, go to gain, gain more power, go to gain more wealth, go forward gaining more substance. I'm not I'm totally detached from it. I'm over here with him because I'm seeking a kingdom whose builder and maker is God. And I know that I could easily get caught up in the system and I would lose my passion for the kingdom that is to come and be consumed by the kingdoms of this world. That's what he told Lot. He said, Lot, be careful. 
You go down in there, you'll be consumed by the kingdoms of this world. You'll be consumed by the spirit of this world. The devil, the demonic realm, humanism says, oh, it's not that bad. Oh, it's not that drastic. Oh, yeah, it is. Because I'm going to tell you right now, if you continue on in sin and God lets you into heaven, heaven's going to become hell. Listen to me. People want God to accept them for what they are. Listen, if he did, heaven would become hell. It would be the same state that we live in now. God's purified it with the blood of Jesus Christ. He will purify it one day with fire. Amen. He will. You listen to me. He will. With fire, he consumes everything that he may create it. The coming of the fire speaks of that day of the newness. The newness. The prophet said <laughs> that the heavens and the earth would dissolve by fire. And he would bring forth a new heaven and a new earth. And in that speaks not only of an event that will take place in the future, but also it is a type of what took place when we became a new creation. Hallelujah. The power of the Holy Ghost came upon us. And a new man was born. A new creation. A new creature to live out a heavenly life in this earthly sojourn. Not to live out an earthly life in this earthly sojourn. Not to go a lusting and wanting and demanding what everybody else is already consumed by. Hello! People start in the new creation and immediately they get distracted and make a decision to be consumed with that which God delivered us from. And no wonder they can't get over the lust of the flesh and they can't stop the pride of life and they can't stop the lust of the eye. they consumed by it. There's no distinction. There's no separation. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. I'm warning you, you listen to me. Yes. I'm warning you. You better make sure that your life lines up with what Jesus said. Let me just read a couple of verses of scripture here. This is not out of context. This is the context. This is what Jesus said. He says the light of the body is, he says the light of the body is the eye. In other words, you see all that you discern because of, an eye, because of your eye. He says, that, and if your eye be single, you don't have double vision, which James also took up and used the same wording and kind of same concept when he's talked about being double-minded. When your eye is single, when you only have one affection, when you only have one desire, so now he's going to take the ability to discern and see in a physical realm. And he's now going to apply the ability to see and discern in a spiritual realm. He says, if your eye be single, in other words, you have clear, plain eyesight spiritually, then your whole being will be full of, filled with light. In other words, if your desire and your affection is only on God and you're detached from everything else and you care not for your life even unto the death, that's how they overcome Satan. By the blood of the Lamb. By the word of their testimony. I'm going to tell you, more people would grow mature in the anointing if they just gave themselves to let the Holy Spirit speak through them, even when they're coming up against strong opposition, like I was in the lift vehicle last night, and I had a captive audience. They still go ahead and they declare the word. They just sow the seed indiscriminately, and they get right to the chase. Jesus is the deliverer. He died for our sins and he rose again from the dead that we also might be dead to sin and live unto God no longer to be a part of this worldly system. People think that it's absolute insanity and madness now. It's a message that is completely, you know, off of any person's sense of normalcy or reality. You're some wild I'm a crazy person. Go ahead, be a wild-eyed crazy person because God's seed, God's word will not return void. It'll bust this thing. It'll break this thing. And that, that hindrance that you feel, that opposition that you feel from telling someone and declaring this radical message of the gospel and of salvation is the power that we're busting through to see a great outpouring of the Spirit come into America once again to flood this Amen. land. Amen. The flood of the land is going to come because you let the river flow through you. Are you listening Amen. to me? <laughs> Dry up the springs and the floods will cease. Dry up the springs. There's a weed out in the country. We call it juniper. It's a weed. It grows, it looks like a tree. You can grow with its trunk that big around. Huge. It's a weed. It soaks up the water. Drinks it up. 
start drinking up all the water from the springs. Soon the flood will begin to diminish. The river will turn to a creek. If it continues to allow to go on, those weeds to grow and suck up all the water so the springs aren't flowing freely, the creek will turn into a dry rock bed. It's true. And so these things have sprung up amongst God's people. And they've allowed the good seed of his word to be mixed with the cares of this life. And it's produced within them thorns instead of fruitfulness. It's choked the word. So God's miracle provision that he pro proclaimed and prophesied over us doesn't come to pass. Look at how his words created out. Just look. Look at all the creation, the natural creation. Look at the sky at night. That's, what his, that's the power of his word. That's the same word that spoke over you and I and described our lives to be what the word of God declares. And the only reason it's not coming to pass in our life is because we're making wrong decisions. And wrong decisions will lead to deception. And deception can have you sitting in church, raising your hands and singing, I love you, Lord. I surrender all. And you just as, you just as given over to the world as anybody else. You just go to church. That's the only difference. Huh? And you may be a little goody two-shoes. But there's none born again, new creation, declaration, the power and the life of Jesus being made manifest in your life because you compromise. Satan is against the anointing. Hello. He's the antichrist spirit that already works in the world. And that's a deceiving power. He is able to deceive the whole world. Jesus said, lest the time would be shortened, the very elect would be, would be deceived. So he shortens the time that the very elect would not be deceived. Somebody said, well, I don't believe, I don't agree. Well, you need to get your scriptures out and get them all lined up over here. Because otherwise, you just you living your life based upon your limited concepts of reality. God's word is life. Yes. It's a light unto us. It's the truth. It is here for us to live by, to have here Christ Jesus, the living word. The written word is all about the living word. You can't say that the living word rules over you when you're not living out what the written word describes. Because they're not, <laughs> they're not in conflict. They're in total agreement. He says, but if your eye be evil. In other words, if your eye is set upon more than one desire, you're trying to do two things. You're double-minded. You believe, but you believe and you want to do what God wants you to do, but you know, you believe and you want to do what you want to do. Huh? God's got plans for you, but you know what? You got plans for yourself. What are you gonna do at the end of, of being a slave for a demonic system? With your eyes having lost the anointing spiritually, you've lost your eyesight. And you've broken the covenant that's been cut off from you, just like Samson. And you go round and round and round grinding meal for the Philistines. And all you're doing is going around the mill. And now all of a sudden, before you know, you know it, you're 60 years old. You're 70 years old. What are you doing now? You old feeble, crippled thing. You've learned how to trust in money and that you're going to completely rely upon it for the rest of your days till you breathe out your last breath. Why would we make such a mistake? When God has called us to a lost and dying world. Hello. There's almost 3 billion people that haven't heard. And we don't, we're, don't, we're certainly not interested in seeing more religious people go and tell them about what they got. <laughs> it's about time people get broken before his presence. And start responding to what God is doing. Because he's calling us deeper still. He's calling us to a place of such, such neediness. Lord, I just, all I want is you. I'm going to be, a, I'm, gonna, I'm dwelling in a tent. Hallelujah. Praise God. If you've got a mortgage and you took out a mortgage for the purposes of the ministry of the gospel, fine. But if you did it, you, you're, you're tied down. You're tied down. If you have a plan within that mortgage and within all those investments of how that finance is going to be completely released into the kingdom of God for the purposes of reaching a lost and dying world, then you may be on track. It's still questionable. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't, all you're doing is living for yourself. Go ahead and confess it and be real. Well, I expect God thinks we should. No, give me a break. Do what he said in his word. Well, the Lord said if you don't provide for your own, then you're worse than an infidel and has denied the faith. Well, you know what? That's one verse of scripture that can be misunderstood so easily. And it shouldn't be because it's up against a thousand verses of scripture that tells you to go with total abandonment and serve God doing what he's purposed for you, us to do in reach in a lost and dying world. So don't give me that nonsense. And, I, I, you know, if you want to talk about it, we'll just discuss it. Because I recognize that most people that go to church haven't read through the Bible one single time. And I give myself to continually studying it, continually. 
every day, volumously, and have for the, the, my life. I know the Word of God. Praise God. I know the Word. You need to know the Word too. And the more you need to get, and if you don't know the Word, start get studying. Get in it. <laughs> give yourself, give all diligence to making your calling and election sure. Get in it. I mean, come on. Understand, it's, this, this is spirit and life. This is the good things of God. You can't pretend with him. Well, Lord, I didn't know. Oh, well, I, my preacher said, he ain't gonna, you know, shame on the preacher. But you know what? It's still your fault because you had a Bible. Never before has the Bible been so available. Never before have we had so much and done so little with it. The church. Never before have we had so much and done so little with it. You can just hear the, you can hear the church back in the 15th century. Oh, God, deliver us. Oh, God. We're being oppressed. We're being burned at the stake. We're being killed. We're being slaughtered all day long. Oh, God, give us some liberty. Give us some liberty so that we may run to the nations as you have mandated in your word. Can you hear them crying? Under that oppression, I can, in the, in the turn of the, uh, the, uh, the century, uh, the turn of the millennia in the ninth century, the oppression of the church, can you hear them crying out? Oh, God, oh, God, can you hear them? Can you hear the martyrs? Can you hear the church crying out, God, just give us a little bit of liberty. Give us a little bit of leeway to where that we're not so hamstrung and confined so that we might run to the nations of the earth. And finally, God brings a great moving of the Spirit and there comes a liberty to the church and suddenly the nations become a part of the cause of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ beginning in, in, much, in, in many respects in Britain in what we'd call the UK now. And then spilling over from Europe into the United States of America. And then we take all the blessings of God and look at what we're doing now. Yeah, we've been, there was a time where we did, up until the 70s, we supported approximately 90% of missions throughout the world. True. But by, by the year 2000, that had greatly dwindled below 50%. And suddenly, you know, not only did, not only did we stop going... And back in the 70s, the church was still sending many missionaries. I had a missions guy tell me, he says, don't give me people from revival churches. They're lemons. I'm not kidding you. That's crazy. Don't give me people who are flowing in the Holy Ghost. They're lemons. That's nuts. Self-serving, self-gratifying, wanting it their way, consumed with their own lust. Well, I'm a person full of the Holy Ghost, and you want me, I guarantee you that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, people. I'm going to stir you up. I'm going to provoke you. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to mess up your hair. I'm going to mess up your religious do. Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. It says, if your eye is evil, then your whole body is full of darkness. Wrong decisions create deception. Literally, this word for evil here is the same word that is used in James chapter 1 where the Lord says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask in faith. God gives it to every man liberally, abundantly, withholds from no one. But let not a double-minded man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. It's the same word, double-minded, evil. You've got two opinions. You've got two desires, two opinions. You got your life you want to live in this world for you and me and my three, huh? And then you got your life you're going to live for Jesus. And you don't live much of a life for Jesus either. Anyway, you give him Sunday morning, maybe Sunday night, a couple hours here, a couple hours there. Maybe 30 minutes of Bible reading and prayer. And the rest of the time, you can soon make money for yourself. And you're thinking about your vacation. You're thinking about your retirement plan. Am I on you? Am I at you? Yeah. Am I getting into anybody's space in here? Are you listening to me? Yeah. Am, I, am I messing with you? Yeah. Do you walk by faith? Do you live by faith? Which is a complete and total dependency upon God for all your provision, for all your perfection, for all your protection. Hey, I don't, I'm going to tell you right now, you can just trust in little uncertain riches. You can trust in uncertain riches if you want to, but I'm going to trust in the living God. Because trusting in the living God, the flame cannot kindle upon you. You will pass through the fire and not be burned. Huh? Radioactive material does not infect you or in any way, in any way cause a disease or, 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 a, or a death or destruction. You better get ready. You better get ready. People think that they live forever. You may not even be alive this afternoon. You may not even be alive by this evening's service. Well, I'm young. I know young people fall over dead. And they medical reason, they just quit living. 
Six, you know, the pathologist comes up with something, well, the heart stopped beating. So thus, he had a heart attack. He just fell over dead. He lies dead. Hmm? I know a preacher that he just died this year. A, a person I knew, he came to this church one time. The, the, his, the diagnosis was, it was like a time clock. This is what the diagnosis of the medical, of the clinician said. It was like his time just run out. His entire body shut down. Entire body. His brain, his liver, his kidney, his heart, his, his gallbladder, his spleen, his eyes, his every cell in his body just shut down. The time clock ran out. Vaughn. Pizza and ice cream. Remember Vaughn? Mom, Ann does. Ruth Ann does. A few people. He came one time. To, here. What's Vaughn's last name? Anyway, you, you think, what are you going to do? Now, what, what was it? What are you going to do? For how long? And you're in charge of how long you're going to live. And you got it all figured out. Give me a break. And then what are you going to do the moment you breathe out your last breath? You're going to give an account for how you live the word. Jesus said, all judgment is given unto me. I judge no man. The word which I've spoken to you will judge you in that day. Okay? So when we're speaking... Somebody said, oh, you're judging. No, God the Father has judged, and we're here declaring his judgments. And if we did not declare his judgments, then we would be deceivers. You listen to me. His word is judgment. His word, judge now. Judge us today, and we'll judge us on that day. Do you know the judgment? I'm going to tell you, not, right now, you're not going to play no patty cake religious games with God. Some make believe. Let me, let me give you this line, song, and dance. Let me shuck, you know, shuck and jive and duck and dive the issue here. Are you with me? In front of his presence. Because everything that you, are, you stand in his presence, all the truth is exposed. You know you cheated. You know you talked yourself into doing something that was contrary to what God had called and purposed for you to do and to be. Are you listening to me? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you if you got other if you got multiple affections, let me give it to you like it is. You got multiple desires, you got multiple affections. He says the light that is in you is darkness, and it's great darkness because there's no greater deception as one who believes that they're absolutely right and they're absolutely wrong because there's no place for conviction to work. Now I'm going to show you that I'm preaching to you the context because he, he, the Lord's going to say the same thing in a different manner right here. He says in verse 24, he brings it out like this now. Two, two opinions, living two different lives. Living a, trying to live a spiritual life and a material life. Trying to live for God, to do his will, and live for yourself, to do your own will. He says right here, he says, no man can be a slave to two masters. No man can be a slave to two masters. What, he's, he's not changed the subject. He's still talking about whether your eye is single or whether your eye is evil or double. He's still talking about where your treasure is, what you really want with your life, where your real desires are, where your real heart affections. He's still talking about the same thing. He's not changed the subject. I believe if people would take Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7 and just start living those three chapters, the whole world would be changed through you. Your life would be absolutely radically changed. You don't even need to go on to any other part of the Bible. Matthew 5, 6, 7, just start living it. First thing you're going to do is you're going to find your desperate need for God the Holy Ghost to come and strengthen you and empower you and give you the ability. <laughs> That's the first thing you're going to find. Second thing you're going to, well, first thing you're going to find is just how wrong you've been living. Second thing you're going to find is how needy you are for his help. Hallelujah. <laughs> and three, you're going to find if you obey God and do what Matthew 5, 6, and 7 uh, says, how completely radically different your rest of your life, the rest of your days on earth will be. Are you going to continue to live the same life you've lived up to this point? Or are you going to conform to the word of God and conform to the image of Jesus Christ? The question is out there for you. You and I were predestinated to be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. To be conformed to the image of the Son. This is, this is the call. We're called to live by the word. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of God. You can have a physical life living by your eating of your bread and all the other stuff that you're eating. <laughs> but you're only going to have a spiritual life by living by the word of God only, solamente, only doing what he said. You want to step into your inheritance? You're going to have to live, learn how to live on the mountain. 
You have to learn how to live on the manna, and it might be in a wilderness, and it might be all kinds of challenges and in rough spots. But you're to, you want to step in your inheritance? You have to learn to live on the manna and follow the cloud and trust God for water from the rock. Ha, 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 hallelujah. Manna stew, manna omelet, huh? manna casserole, <laughs> manna smoothie, <laughs> manna manna. That's it. Manna, the word. I took them that I, through the wilderness that I might prove them and try them. See if that they would be obedient or not. To test them, to show them that man does not live by bread alone. He, Deuteronomy 8, 3. But by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, who came as the champion for all mankind, destroyed the powers of darkness and defeated and overthrew their best offensive against him with one simple Old Testament scripture, Deuteronomy 8, 3. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then he went on concerning these affections. And he said, we serve God alone and worship him alone. You know, the Lord gives to us this, this statement. Here's what Father's whole desire is for men. That we love him with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, with everything that is within us. We love him. All of our affections, all of our desires are wrapped up in all that he's given. And honestly, honestly, if we really truly believe what he said that he's given to us, how could we have any other kind of response? If we really believe that we blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, if we really believe that all these riches in Christ Jesus are ours, that they've been made available to us, that all of heaven is ours, that all of his fullness, that all of his resources are ours, how could we have any other legitimate response than to have all of our affections and all of our desires wrapped up in him? If you be risen with Christ, then you're going to seek those things which are above. Set your affections not on things of this earth, but on things above where you're seated with Christ Jesus. Colossians 1, 1 through 3. Chapter 3, 1 through 3. Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Thank you. You can't be a slave to masters. He, he tells us very clearly, you will either hate the one and love the other. In other words, the, the best way that you could, if you reduce this, the best way you could describe it is you least prefer one over the other. You're not going to have equally pre equal preference for both. Are you listening? But the Lord just puts it down this way, love or hate. He's just going to say, you love me or you hate me. That's what he's going to say. And we'll say, oh, no, 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 no. He said, no, you do. And I'm going to show you how you love me or you hate me based upon your deeds. The first epistle of John says this so loud and clear and so redundantly that anybody who reads the first epistle of John and you read it with an honest and sincere heart, you correct it right away. You recognize you've got to change. Things about your life have got to change now. Huh? And we find you in the altar. And we find you not punching a religious time clock because you've got a prayer, but we pray, go to prayer every day. But we find you desperate for the things of heaven, recognizing how needy, how needy you are of him. How... how how desperate you are for his intervention in your life. We need an intervention. Huh? People have lost their mind. Huh? They come completely crazy. Huh? They all drugged out on materialism. Huh? They've been taken hostage into some kind of a cult called a Luciferian cult, a world system. They need an intervention. We need to go in there and grab them out, steal them out. <laughs> the only way we're allowed to do that was with the word. We can only intervene with the word. People, the, the, the results of what's going to happen in the city, in this nation, in the nations of the world, rest upon our response his great salvation and his love for us and the gifting and the opportunity that he's given. Suddenly that's got to be bigger than the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life. God created us his image and his likeness after righteousness and true holiness. To live out this wonderful, beautiful, 
place of divine glory and purity. And you're going to have to start saying no to some stuff. You're going to have to start saying no to some stuff. You're going to have to get yourself some Holy Ghost will. He says you can't serve two masters. He says you're going to either hate the one and love the other, or you'll hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The, in, for King James, many of you may have different translations. King James actually just basically transliterated the Greek word because this is the Greek word, the Greek origin. It literally means earthly provision, wealth, or possessions. You know where most people find their wealth? Are you ready? You ready for it? You ready? Their job. That's your wealth. It's your piggy bank. Do you know that? It's true. Go ahead and smile. Go ahead and smile. Huh? Because it's either consecrated to God or you're trying to hide. Don't run in shame just because the voice of God is speaking to you. Don't go run and hide because all of a sudden you're naked. Don't go run and hide. Just stand up. Say, Lord, clothe me. Lord, put some clothes on me here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Clothe me, Papa. Because he's come with garments to clothe you. He's come get you, you get clothed right now. Don't go run and hide at the voice of the Lord. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody said, well, you think we all just all quit our jobs? That might help. <laughs> might help, but I doubt it. Because it's about your heart. You're going to have to become detached to all that stuff. Because you can basically quit your job, be on the streets, and still just as attached to all the worldly, earthly interests. There's got to be a heart change. There's got to be an affection change. There's got to be a, a consecration of your will to obey God and do what He says, no matter what it costs you. I'm just looking for people here in this place. God is looking for people here in this place to simply take all of their desires and all their affections, detach them completely from the world and attach them to him where nothing matters. And you can, your job can be gone and you're like shrug your shoulders going, or it doesn't matter, saying free at last, free at last. Oh God, what am I going to do now for you? Huh? Whatever. Are you listening to me? Come on, people. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, people. I know what I'm talking about here. God, the Holy Ghost, woke me up early this morning and said, you just tell those people, get detached. Amen. They're never going to be able to obey me so long as their affections are seated upon the earthly interest and the things that are only temporal. And there's test after test after test that we go through. My, when we begin to hit that realm of divine glory and the anointing begins to be expressed through us and the atmosphere begins to become charged by our prayers, hallelujah, and charged by the, the worship that we give. Oh, now all of a sudden, that beautiful anointing of his presence is beginning to break forth through our life. Now you just go deeper. Now you just go deep. Now you just stay faithful. Now, all of a sudden, the Antichrist spirit who hates the anointing is going to come out after you in every direction. But as long as you are totally detached from all the stuff that he can use to try to impact you, all of his efforts are futile, powerless. vain, powerless. <laughs> but if your heart's attached to stuff that he's going to use, you're going to be taken out. You're going to be tripped up. Because he's going to work. He can only work in his system. He can only work in his realm. I've drawn, a, I've drawn a bloodline between me and him. Ha! He can't cross over the bloodline. I've got to come over into his realm for his stuff to impact me, affect me. I'm standing up here on the other side of the bloodline going, I'm totally detached from you. I don't care nothing. Neener, neener, neener. I care nothing <laughs> about the world and all your stuff and all your wealth and all your riches and all your desires of the flesh and your desires of the eye. My single... My affection is single. I have one desire. Hallelujah. I'm desperate and needy for the flow of heaven. Because the desire for him produces within us a flow of his presence. When we're compromised by the world, when we are assimilated, hopefully not, but at least neutralized, there's no continual flow, there's no continual glory. Your prayers don't become more powerful. Huh? As soon as the in powers of darkness, here's a prayer, a song, a worship, a plea. 
coming out of you that is deeper in the anointing, he's going to start using everything at his disposal that belongs to a realm of his cosmos, of his world system, to try to shut you down. You've got to be detached from his works. Otherwise, you're just going to be a puppet on a string. You cannot be a slave to two masters. Abraham shows us how to walk with God, even the most affectionate and loving thing. Are you going to tell me that you're going to tell me that Abraham did not love Ishmael? He loved Ishmael. God says, "Send Ishmael away." Send Ishmael away and Hagar. Send them. They cannot inherit the blessings. The compromised. Send them away. Abraham could have loaded up dromedaries by the hundreds, provisions for months. Now he sent him out with a little water and a little bread. He cast them into the care of Almighty God. In his love and affection for them, his love and affection for Father was greater, and he cast them forth into the care of Almighty God. Come on, people. You don't, you're going to tell me that old loving, tender, compassionate, merciful, Abraham did not love Isaac? You're going to tell me he did not have all his life and purpose and meaning and value after the natural wrapped up in Isaac? Sure he did. His love and his affection was greater for father, though. He was detached in comparison. He was able to take Isaac and thrust him into the love and care and protection of God Almighty. He was totally detached because he was completely attached. His affection, were, though it was great for Isaac, was greater for father. Though his love was great for Isaac, his love was greater for father. And he knew that in father's hand, all that he needed and all that he desired was safely trusted. Listen to me. Safely entrusted. It's time we step up. It's time you step up. It into all worry. You won't have sleepless nights anymore. Huh? The enemy will not be able to torment you with destruction and death and turmoil and paint a picture of your life before you and describe to you all that you're going to miss out on if you get so radical and start obeying God like Pastor says. Start reading for your own, and you won't have to be doing it because pastor said. You'll be hearing directly from heaven yourself. Huh? I never read around the scripture. I confront it head on. Hallelujah. Because it's life to me. It's spirit and life. It's hallelujah. It's living and it's powerful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's life and death. It's where the blessings of God reside forevermore. It is that which Father has given to us to be able to inherit all things. His word. Living and written. The written is just about the living. Praise God for the written word because I didn't get to behold him like John did. I didn't get to behold him like Peter did. But Peter said, we have a more certain word of prophecy. Yeah, we saw Jesus lit up with the glory. Yes, we heard the Father. We saw Moses and we saw Elijah standing there. And we heard Father speak a audible voice. He said, but we've got a more certain word of prophecy. He said, that which is written in the Bible. That's what he said. I just All I did right there was just to verbalize it with a, with a more clear, loose defined, loosely, def loosely defined translation, as it were. We do, you do heed if you take, you do well if you take heed unto a light shining in a dark place. The scriptures. <laughs> it was given to us by inspiration. It's written, it's settled, it's profitable for instruction. It's profitable for direction. It's profitable for correction. It's what Father has given to us so that we can understand exactly what He's purposed to do and exactly what Christ Jesus looks like and exactly what He's made us to be in Him. This is where you stand at the crossroads of decision. And there's all your dreams and visions in God that have been developed by the Holy Ghost through His Word, through the examples of faith. And all that the world has for you, and primarily it's defined as money, mammon, where your wealth is, 
your earthly possessions, your earthly, your earthly provision. What happens if you die today? He would say, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. Oh, yeah, he is. No question about it. You know what? But he's probably going to come back. He's probably going to come back for you before he comes back for the whole church. And you do not know when he's coming. Are you ready? Somebody said, yeah, I'm ready. Do you look like this word? Are you doing with all your heart and all your passion by the Spirit of the Lord that which God said in His Word? Because if you're not, you will not hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. You will not. Jesus said, I always do those things which please the Father. So He said, so what He declared, John chapter 6, that's 45, I believe it is. I always do those things that please the Father. I do too, so long as I'm in Him. So long as I'm doing what He's doing. Now, you're going to say that you always do what pleases the Father and you're not doing what he's doing? You're just, you're lying to yourself. You're deceived. It's time to change. And where does that start? It starts with, it starts in the encounter. It starts with your response and to his love. Lord, I want to be what you call me to be. I'm, I consecrate myself to do your will, Father. No longer my will. And no longer are you going to just pray haphazardly. It's just pray w without thinking, thy will be done in this earth as it is in heaven. You're listening to me. Yes. Because Father, how is you responsible for that? Yes. Okay. You said to me. He said, many say in that day, Lord, he said, we cast out devils in your name. We did mighty signs and wonders in your name. And he, and he shows an extreme position because he's saying not everyone who says that Christ Jesus is my Lord, that I'm walking right, that I'm right with God, is, is saved. He said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will come into the kingdom of God. And that's it's the same as to say, not everyone who says that Christ Jesus is Lord is saved. It's because there's many in that day that's going to say, we've done all these things for you. And so they're the upper, they're the, they would be, the, they would be the, the top shelf, right? They would be the top layer of folks because they're doing all these things for the Lord, right? Casting out devils in his name, signs and wonders in his name. Huh? People getting saved in his name. He says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I don't know you. Depart from me, you person that never quit sinning. I have no idea who you are. I do not know you. I have no fellowship with you. Understanding what I'm saying is your walk with God, your affection being all placed in him, is going to begin and going to be nurtured and established in your fellowship with him, in your interaction with him. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Some of you people, I'm just telling you right now. There's people in here today, you at the crossroads. No matter where you're at, God is calling you deeper and deeper. But some of you are at the crossroads because you've deferred decision over and over again. You always behind the eight ball. You always in a t pit too, di too deep to dig yourself out. Why don't you just, with total abandonment, throw your affections into God and walk out on yourself? Just do a walk out on yourself. Just walk out on yourself. I'm done with you. I'm done. I'm done. Lord, I'm hallelujah. Just do a walk out. I mean, just go on strike, but do worse than that. Go on strike to never return. I want to read this verse of scripture to you. If I can find it, you can help me find it. Of course, I've already found it. Matthew 10, verse 37. I want you to read it. Don't you, I want you to read it for what it is. I want you to come and play make-believe. Don't tell me. Don't get, your, don't get your scholastic opinion out. Don't go home and look at a concordance to try to steal the word of God from you. Are you listening to me? He that loves Father... Or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Abraham, you get rid of Ishmael and Hagar now. You cast them out. You hear me? 
Now, here's what I'm believing God. I'm believing God. There ain't nobody going to sit here and hear this religiously. I am actually putting the fire of God and the Holy Ghost on you right now to burn in your mind and your affection so you cannot escape this floodlight of heaven and try to pretend like you've got something that you don't have. If you have this con consecration and you have all your affections in him, then praise God, fine. All you're doing is with excitement and, 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 and passion uh, right now saying, yes, Lord, more of me, huh, and less of you. Amen. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm messing with you on purpose <laughs> because that's what happens over and again. It gets totally turned upside down. Deception sets in. People can't think right. Lord, less of me. In fact, you go from the less to the none. How do you go from how do you go from how do you go from less? How do you go from more to less and less to none? And it shouldn't be progressive, but usually it is because it, it, just because we're hard of hearing, our senses are dull. Praise God. You know, the disciples around Jesus, and he still showed him mercy when he said, how is it that you're so dull of hearing, that you're so faithless? I've been with you so long, and you still don't get it. Huh? Here's how. You start doing the word. You start living by the word. You stop excusing yourself and making it belong to the pastor and to the preachers and to some select group of people who are favored by God. So that they can go do your work for you. I've discovered people are just lazy. They're just lazy. And that's something you've got to get over. Huh? You've learned, you've, some of you just, all you've ever done is wash dishes at most. And we take you out and we give you some hard labor and put a shovel and a pickaxe in your hand in the heat of the day. And you're out of breath after 30 minutes. You're about to pass out. We're going to have to call 911. You're a candidate for the emergency room. <laughs> Complete exhaustion, rehydration, intervenous, you know, infusion of, of electrolytes. I've discovered this. I've watched it over and again. I told some people the other day, I said, you know, they were kind of working. They were working hard by their definition. And I'm like, what? you got to be kidding me. It's taking how long to do that? I mean, I promise you I could have done this in an hour. You took two weeks? I promise you I could have done this in an hour. And I look at them and said, here's what happens. People think that ministry and missions is a bunch of fun and game and spotlight, uh, you know, a spotlight thing, you know, going on where you just now come to fame and fortune. Listen, it's hard work. It's labor. It's blood, sweat, and tears. It's sacrifice. It's a cross. I just don't understand what it means to take up my cross. I understand you don't know what it means to take up your cross. Can you please explain that to me? No, you've got to do it. You have to do it. Hallelujah. Come on, people. Quit being lazy in the things of the Spirit. Quit being lazy. Come on, man. Put your whole affection. Put your whole affections here. Abraham's our model. He's, that's why Paul says in Romans chapter 4, he's the father of faith. He's the example of how to walk in faith. Faith, is, faith, is, faith finds its whole foundation. And absolutely trusting God with your life. Guess what? One second after you breathe out your last breath and you're floating around, what are you going to do now? Now what are you going to go? Now what are you going to do? Now who are you going to trust? Do you know the way? Huh? Have you ever gone that, have you ever taken that trail home? Do you know the path of it? The function of it? No, you don't. You know nothing about it. Come on now. Don't look at me like you got it under control. You've, you've, at that moment in time, if you've trusted him, your life is that much more fully entrusted to him. For his care, his provision, his benevolence. Huh? Well, I'm telling you right now, it's not going to work out for you then. If it's not established, why are you still in your body? You hear me now. You hear me. You hear me now. You listen to me. Yeah. Somebody said, well, isn't there kind of like 
a, a third, second and third class citizen in the kingdom of God? I mean, isn't there option B and C for walking with the Lord? Could, do I, do, do, huh. If what you say is true, then who can be saved? Who can be saved? Anyone who does the will of the Father. Those who do not, will not. Who can be saved? Those who are born again and made a new creation and who live the life of Jesus. Jesus called us to come and dwell in him. It's the chief theme of the Bible. Here's what Jesus says. He that does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He that finds his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. He's saying, if you lose your life, you can live my life. He says it over and over and over again in so many ways. He says, you come and live my life or you come abide in me, come and live my life and I will live in you. It's just like God saying to Abraham, Abraham, how should they know that you sent me? You go do what I told you to do and you can come back here and worship me. Obedience. You come and live my life. You go ahead and you understand that you've been commissioned and you've been called and you've been sent to do exactly what I showed you, exactly how I live my life. Father allows us. He allows us to marry. He allows us to have children. He allows us to raise families. I love the story of Philip. Philip was one of the seven, you know. By Acts chapter 8, he's already come to greatness. Acts chapter 8, he goes into Samaria and preaches Jesus. Look at what he's doing. He's living the life. Huh? And, uh, and then, you know the story, Acts chapter 8, the whole place is filled with joy, seeing the miracles which he did. Then the Lord left, call, caused him to leave that revival in Samaria and go down and meet up with a eunuch in, in the wilderness from Ethiopia. The eunuch gives his life to the Lord, is baptized. Philip's caught away. He ends up where? In Caesarea, right? Many years later, Paul's going through Caesarea. Guess who's there? Philip. He's got it going on. He's got four daughters who prophesize. He's got it going on. He goes from Caesarea, goes from Joppa. He's caught away to Joppa, goes from Joppa to Caesarea. He stays in Caesarea. But you can look, if you read the text, you can see that all of the mighty men of God were coming to Caesarea to Philip's place. All, you just look at it, they're all there. Every, all the prophets, all the men of God, they're kind of hubbing out of what God then caused Philip to do as he's raising his family, and look at what he reproduces. But come on, people. We, we are going to have to understand that Father has purposed that we take up the plan that Adam bailed out on. We have to understand God has purposed that we take up the plan that Israel as a nation was unwilling to fulfill and bring forth the fruit thereof. He hasn't called you and I as the church to be a bunch of eunuchs. Praise God. He's caused us to be people filled with the life and glory, the heavenly people, the heavenly family of God doing those things from the heart that he's empowered us to do through the new creation, raising sons and daughters that are mighty in him. Because our life is completely consecrated and sowed into the kingdom. And not trusting, not living out a life that is defined by the world system. Don't confuse this. Because this is where people go astray. They start trying to define how they're going to live out their life as a family in God, doing what Abraham did, doing what the model of a we see with Abraham, doing the model that Israel expressed to us, walking in that model of the early church, but being assimilated by the world. Stop it. Stop it now. Understand, the Lord's called you and I to take up our cross and follow him to lose our life. If what you're doing is by definition completely with total abandonment, living out the will of God, because that's what the cross represents, living out the will of God, not living for yourself, living out the will of God. If there's anything you prioritize, I'm going to tell you right now, if there's anything you prioritize over seeking the things of, of the kingdom, over fulfilling God's divine commission and call upon our life, then it is an evident token that your, that your eyes are not single, that your affections are not all completely set in Him. And, and all you got to do is say, look, no more. I'm stopping today. I'm going to live out the rest of my life, take up my cross following Him, 
having all my affections in him, doing those things from the heart that he's described, not living my own life, living that which Father has defined for me. You've got to lose your life. Today, if you're in this place and you have not lost your life, we're inviting you to lose your life today. We're inviting you to lose it so bad you can never find it again. We pray you don't lose it and it'd be like a coin that you sweep the whole house trying to find it. Take it back up again. God's calling you to lose your life. Once again, I don't believe I can emphasize this enough. You're going to find out first and foremost in you pouring out your whole heart and your affections to Him and stop playing games with God and stop holding on to yourself. Where all of a sudden we begin to see and you begin to see your whole value and need and desire is in Him. It's going after His manifest presence right now. His glory revealed to you right now. His person, His power and his expressions being realized you by you and revealed through you. This is, a, this is what God's called, of, called us to do. It's what he's called us to have. What a blessing. He called us to have all of him. So what were you thinking about doing? Huh? What was your struggles? What were your big decisions? making issues that you're processing. The Lord says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Seek first everything that Christ Jesus described to us, everything that he revealed. When Nicodemus looked at Jesus and said, Rabbi, Master, I know that you're a teacher come from God for no one could do these works that you do unless God be with them. And Jesus responds to him and says, if you you want to come into this realm of the kingdom. You want to step into this realm of the spirit. You want to step into the realm of, this, of, of, of the heavenlies. You must be born again. Have you been born again now to live out your life in the heavenly realm, a life being filled with the things of the Holy Ghost, doing from the heart that which the spirit of the Lord leads and directs you to do? Are you still holding, have you been born again to hold on to your own life and to have half of the decisions or one third of the decisions still left up to you? Are you obeying God's word? Are you looking for God's counsel about things that the Bible maybe are not very specific about? And you're there in the throes of a decision, but your whole heart so in his affections and your desires are all in him. And he says to you, cast out Ishmael. And you just get up and do it. And you don't put a whole caravan of camels together and load it up with provision for four or five months and saddle one of them with enough gold to last a lifetime. Did you know he could have set them up like that? We're not in Genesis 13 anymore. He's already got all the gold and all the silver and all the flocks and all the herds and all the, all the wealth and all the riches. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you see you? Do you see your decision making? Is all your trust in him? I'm going to close with this one last verse of scripture for you. And I just want you to live it. I want you to grab a hold of it. I want you to become so needy because you don't value. You know, what does he happen in your crystal and, 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 and you know, others are just... You, you, you place your value in what you can do in the kingdom. You place your value in having the flow of the anointing in your life, in your music, in your worship. That's place, it begins to place all of your value and all your desire and all you want in Him. And I tell you, it gets bigger than that. It gets bigger. It gets bigger. It gets bigger than just His manifest presence in your life. It, it advances to being all about him. All about interacting with him, walking with him, knowing him, being one with him. But it's places of beginning. And I'm talking about the places of beginning because I watch people and all immediately they start jumping over into a place where they're now going to quit their job and now they're thinking about where they're going to live now that they quit their job because now they don't have any money to pay the rent. Why are they going to eat? Because they don't have any money for food. And the Lord's already dealt with that in Matthew chapter 6. I didn't spend the time with it. He said, take no thought. And, and, and to dilute it best, to dilute it as much as rather as we're allowed, 
don't be concerned with what you're going to eat and don't be concerned with what you're going to wear because this is what all the nations and all the heathen and all the lost and all the people caught in the world system go after. But you go after the kingdom. You go after what I'm going to do for you. You be a stranger and a sojourner and a pilgrim in this world seeking a kingdom whose builder and maker is God. I know I'm blending verses of scripture together with Matthew chapter 6, but it is absolutely in context. Can you hear me? Yeah. Do you hear me yet? Knock, knock. That's Jesus. That's bang. It's Jesus banging. He's still banging at the door of many people's hearts. That's why I'm continuing on. He's still standing there banging, saying, open up and I will come in and fellowship with you. Listen to me. Too many people have found their way in the Laodicean, in the Laodicean state, pleasing themselves, doing what pleases them, what's valuable for them, how they can handle it. Huh? You listen to me? Can you imagine it? Your mama Sarah. But a Sarah, I'm going to give you another one. Your mother Rachel. No, let me give you another one. You just, your, your, your mother. Deborah. In Israel. And you're going around in the wilderness. Obeying God, following the cloud. Right? You just set up the tent. Just got it set up. The cloud is moving. Take tent down. I just set the tent up. We're moving. Okay. Next time, cloud sets. You go, cloud stops. You're camping. I'm not setting this tent up. I'm not setting this tent up. We're going to watch the cloud. I'm not, I know what happened last time. I said, the, no, I got the tent set up. Now it's three days. Okay, I'm going to set the tent up. You set the tent up. Tent's up. You got all the stuff unpacked. You got everything all organized. You create a playground for the kids. Three months have gone by. Four months have gone by. You're feeling good. Well, we're here. You're starting now to become more planted, more familiar, more comfortable with your surroundings, looking and having a vision about how you could live here for the rest of your life, and now the cloud starts moving. And you're going, no way. No. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. No. And you have no choice because everybody else is going no. And you're going to be out there uncomfortable all by yourself. And the Lord had Israel go through that for 40 years because of the disobedience. I'm going to teach you how to trust me and obey me. And it's going to be about your will. You're going to go by my defined judgment. It's going to be what I say. We're not going to take a popular vote. And I don't care who's preaching another sermon saying, we camp in here for two years. God told me, because the cloud starts moving, we're going. <laughs> and you can stay with your prophet who said you're camping there for two years if you want, but the cloud's going because God's going to make the decision. Yeah. You're never going to do that unless you're totally detached. Say detached. detached. You're never going to do it unless you're totally detached. Satan has no impact upon you when you're totally detached. You don't want it. I don't want it. He comes with this, lust, lust. I don't want it. I'm totally detached. I don't want him. I want the realms of heaven. I want the realms of spirit. I'm living, I'm, I, I, I'm smarter than an ant. You might not be, but I'm smarter than an ant. <laughs> Consider the ant, thou sluggard. Amen. How it prepares for the future. I'm preparing for the future. I'm preparing for that realm that lasts forever. This just dress rehearsal for. There is a realm that right now we are laying up treasure in. We are sowing into. Come on. You sow a little flesh. You shall reap corruption. You sow into the realms of the spirit. You shall reap everlasting life. I'm talking about what are you doing for the rest of eternity, not what you're doing this for the rest of your natural life. I'm talking about what you're doing for the rest of eternity, being defined by what you do right now with your natural life. Wake up. Wake up. Hello. Wake up. You're running out of time. You're running out of time. Father's purpose, great things for your life. You're running out of time. Every decision, every decision has a huge consequence. Wrong decisions are going to produce deception every time. Every time. Can you repent for wrong decisions? Yeah, you can. It's hard, though. Because you've got to go all the way back to where you left. 
you got to go all the way back to that place that you decided not to be in or the thing you decided not to do. And sometimes it's difficult. I was going through a situation the other day, some time ago. Somebody was saying the same that thing. I said, I submit myself to the judge of judges. You judge me now, Father. If I'm chased into the Lord, and I'm judged by the Lord, that I should not be condemned with the world. Praise God, I've stepped into a relationship that you can have right now today that I want you to have, to where you begin to live your life at the throne of judgment. Not out of, out of pretend, out of you just loosey-goosey deciding whatever, and the, the decisions about whether or not it's right or wrong will be, deci you know, be decided later, confirmed later. No, I'm living right now in this judgment. I, just com I commit myself or submit myself to the judge of judges. You judge me, Lord. Whatever you want me to do, I'll, I'll do it. Whatever this ruling, whatever your ruling is, I submit to it. <laughs> I'll just tell you right now, your computer visits the right places every time. Your television goes to the right channels every time. Huh? Your eyes are fixed on me. You've made a covenant with your eyes. They look at the right things all the time. Hallelujah. Your treatment of other people becomes completely reorganized and redefined all the time. You're not sitting back in your own little world, <laughs> making it up as you go, feeling sorry for yourself or whatever else it may be. And out of that, then, deciding why other people... You deserve more and other people deserve less because your mind will play tricks on you. And Come on now. Things you're never going to understand until you submit yourself completely to the Lord because it's a wisdom higher than any human being has. It's a wisdom and insight that belongs to the ages. It's a wisdom and insight that belongs to those people who live out their life in an eternal perspective instead of one temporal. Because much of your decision is based upon what you're getting today and tomorrow and next week and how you see your, you know... Uh, Career path progressing. Hello. Are you listening to me? Yeah. You better be listening to me because I'm talking your stuff. Colossians 1. Rather than Colossians chapter 3. Let me just close with this. I want you to come back here tonight so fired up. To seek, to seek after those things that belong to Father. To let Papa tell you whether or not you're going to Tajikistan or Kashmir or Asia, I, I shared Sharon Smith's her post this morning on my Facebook page as they're leaving Thailand, and she's talking about how her heart is full to return to Thailand, to return to Asia, to see people who would be raised up, who would pour out their lives for a, a lost and dying world. People never heard Laos. You can't preach the gospel in Laos right now unless you're full of the Holy Ghost and don't care about your life. The Laotians are beautiful people, wonderful people. They're held in prison. And very few people even go. It takes a Baptist or a Jesuit priest. Pentecostal stayed at home. Maybe they needed to. Come on, man. There's a lost and dying world all around you. If the Lord, lived, the Lord left me, would allow me, I could go tomorrow and start a ministry in downtown San Diego in the barrios, and inside of a year, I'd have over a 1,000 kids in the meeting, a 1,000 children from the ages of 4 to 12 years old. They're there for the picking. They're there for the harvest. And the Trentes and the Red Steps and the, all the other gangs would just leave you alone because you're taking care of the... You're, you're taking care of the little brothers and sisters, and there's a hope that they may not end up, because they know that they've ended up bad. They know. Everybody who's lost, they know they've ended up bad. There's no poverty like a loneliness and a meaningless existence. It's true. And everybody who's not walking with God have, has plenty of both. You can have all the money you want, but if you've not lived out your life for Jesus, you poverty-stricken. People come on, the harvest is plenteous. What are you going to do with your life? There's souls by the thousands out there. Who's going to go? Who's going to spend their lunchtime? Who's going to spend their afternoons? We're praying about having weekend revival meetings here, at least doing Saturdays and Sunday nights. 
to start with and to see where it goes from there. Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, just hit it three times, get people in three meetings, boom, boom, boom. Because a lot of times we just have to do, come back on Sunday morning, do a breakthrough meeting, as it were, Sunday night, then a little bit of a revival meeting for the people that finally showed up. And then the people that really needed to be there Sunday night weren't there, so we had to come back Sunday morning and try to do a breakthrough meeting just to get them there Sunday night. And then once a month they show up Sunday night, they get a little touch from heaven, then they're lost again for another two months, and they come. Sounds like Samson. Oh, should the people begin to seek God with their whole heart? Being totally detached from everything that Satan would throw at you so he, can, he comes and he has nothing in you, so all of his tricks won't work on you no more. Huh? See, Satan's not very bright. He's got a one-trick pony. One trick's all his pony can do. When you learn that trick, man, you, you know what? You no longer fall prey to his devices. It's true. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm so excited because my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm so excited because my name's written in heaven. I'm so excited because I'm seated together with Christ Jesus. I'm so excited because I don't, I get to not, I get to live his life and I don't have to live my life anymore. I'm so excited that I don't have to be caught up in all the stuff that everybody is functioning as slaves to a system. I'm clean, set free. I live in divine system, hallelujah, over here. Uh, we're a father, a provider of all that I have need of. I have a walk of faith where every step I trust him for all that I have need of in every dimension of life for my maturity, perfection, for my provision, my daily bread, my food, and my clothing, and my housing, and everything that I have need of and for my protection. Somebody says, what about Japan and, however, forgive me, how about China and, and Russia's joint tactical military exercises for the past 10 years and what they're planning behind the scenes right now. So I'm not worried. Let the bombs come. Let the nuclear explosions come. I'm good to go. I don't need no bunker. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm in the cloud of glory. I do well in the secret place of the Most High under the shadow of the Almighty. That's better than any bunker, praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> I don't need army boots and a machine.